Good morning, everybody. So we're going to move on to the clinical care pathways uh, uh, when, he, when we approach a patient with newly diagnosed diabetes. Uh, so uh, the first pathway is going to be uh, the uh, flow, flow that has to be followed when a, a girl with newly diagnosed diabetes uh, presents to our clinic. So the first question is uh, to be uh, to Dr. Beatrice Zani. Uh, so when a child who is less than uh, 10 years presents um, to our OP with a sudden onset of hyperglycemia, catabolic symptoms and all that, so how would you go about the workup of the child? A very good morning to all of you and uh, thank you for the question, Dr. Amala. So we basically look at the clinical picture. So if this is a child with classic hallmark symptoms of so let's say polyuria and polydipsia and child is coming to you with diabetic ketoacidosis, we need to think in the lines of type 1 diabetes. And uh, if possible, get antibodies done, which uh, there are no cost con constraints, of course. And we can confirm the diagnosis along with the C-peptide. On the other hand, let's say we have a child uh, who's lean and uh, not in decay with family history of young onset diabetes, say three generations with young onset diabetes, with uh, fairly OK C-peptide and antibodies are negative then we need to think in lines of uh, MODI, that is maturity onset of diabetes in the young. So this differentiation is important because our management is going to depend on that. Once we make a diagnosis of type 1 diabetes, it's going to be insulin lifelong. On the other hand, certain forms of MODI can still be treated with uh, oral drugs. And with the increase in uh, prevalence of childhood obesity, an obese child with features of insulin resistance, we also need to keep type 2 diabetes in mind. Yeah. So my next question would be to Dr. Belinda. Uh, so what if an adolescent or adolescent girl or a young adult, like uh, say a 23 or 24 year, year old girl presents to our OP with the same uh, symptoms like sudden onset of hyperglycemia, she's very catabolic. Uh, so how do you go about with that? Uh, thank you, Dr. Amla. Thank you, Dr. Amla, and very good morning to all of you. Uh, at the outset, let me congratulate Dr. Usha on this fantastic program. Uh, so with regards to our question, how do we approach a young adult or an adolescent who comes to our OPD with new onset diabetes mellitus? So just like uh, Beatrice had mentioned, I think uh, now we are seeing a lot of cases of childhood obesity. So type 2 diabetes in, young, in the young is actually on the rise. So it is important for us to keep that as a differential diagnosis at the back of our minds, because earlier, every young adult or an adolescent who would present with hyperglycemia was almost always treated as type 1 diabetes. So now it is possible that we are dealing with non-type 1 diabetes in this age group. So it becomes more important for us to distinguish between these two forms of diabetes so that we can give the appropriate therapy. But at the outset, if the, when the patient is visiting you uh, for the first time, that differentiation is not that important in the sense like what uh, the previous panelists were mentioning i think it's extremely important for us to initiate somebody on on insulin if they are presenting uh, with how dr amala just described catabolic symptoms hyperglycemic symptoms so there it doesn't matter your diagnosis later might become type 2 but it's all right if you think that this patient requires insulin it's all right to initiate the patient on insulin and then at your own pace uh, you know evaluate and find out whether the patient has truly type 1 or type 2 or some other a rare form of genetic syndrome which causes diabetes. So what are the steps that we would do? Number one, of course, we will look at the clinical symptom symptomatology to get any clues whether this could be either type 1 or if you're talking about adults, this could even be LADA, which is a late and onset autoimmune form. So they may have other autoimmune diseases uh, uh, as clinical clues. You can also get antibody okay. testing and uh, you can do a C-peptide level to see the uh, preservation of beta cells. So based on all of that, then you can categorize the patient as either type 1, type 2 or other forms of diabetes. And if the patient has classical features of insulin resistance like acanthosis migricans and uh, obesity and if the BMI is high again all of them point towards type 2 so you are likely to be dealing with type 2 than type 1. Uh, so how feasible do you think uh, that these um, antibody testing and uh, the MODI gene workup or will be in our uh, Indian set of patients Dr. Belinda? 
So if uh, cost is not a constraint, these are easily available across the country. However, if the patient has cost constraint, like many of our children actually do, we uh, take decisions based on uh, our clinical acumen and then decide whether the patient requires insulin or not. Um, with time, of course, they can also arrange the finances and uh, do a couple of tests that would actually decide the fate of the further course of therapy. Sure, thank you. And the cost has actually come down compared to before. Like now we do a clinical exome sequencing for around 12 to 13,000 in Hyderabad. And so we sort of, uh, you know, <coughs> prime the patient that, you know, this may be required later. So they do, you know, tend to uh, arrange the finances and get it done at a later date. Yeah. And I also know a few centers which uh, do this antibody testing at a subsidized cost. For example, the Tamil Nadu MGR University, it does this antibody testing at a very uh, sustainable cost. Yeah. Dr. Parjeet Kaur, uh, so how do you deal with a girl who's pregnant now? So she comes to you with a, a new pre with pregnancy and a newly diagnosed diabetes. How do you go about with her? Right. A very good morning to all and thank you, Dr. Amla. It's a very clinically relevant question because earlier it used to be, uh, the definition used to be like any diabetes which is recognized the first time during pregnancy was labeled as GDM. However, it had many drawbacks, many flaws, because many of the undetected, undiagnosed pre-existing diabetes were not uh, uh, captured at that point of time, which led to eventually uh, poor pregnancy outcomes. So we really need to differentiate between these two uh, diagnosis, diagnosis of diabetes, whether the lady has a pre-existent diabetes or whether she has DDM. Uh, so the test which we do uh, to detect diabetes in the first trimester itself now the test is recommended. It's kind of a universal screening for us because we Asian Indians are at high risk of diabetes. There's a diabetes epidemic going on. So all the ladies must be tested for diabetes in the first trimester, that's less than 12 weeks itself. The first 12 weeks, the test we do for diagnosis is the same as we do for adults or non-pregnant adults by either by checking the HbA1c or a fasting plasma glucose or a simple OGTT of 75 grams where we do just a zero and two hours. That's for the first trimester. So if the HbA1c is coming above or equal to 6.5, or the fasting plasma is more than or equal to 126, or if the lady has clear cut symptoms with a random glucose of more than 200, or if you do OGTT and we get the results as we do for the diagnosis of uh, diabetes in non-pregnant adults, we label this lady as having a pre-existing diabetes. It's very, very important because the management will differ, the prognosis will differ. Now for diagnosis of GDM, what we do is uh, if, if the test is completely normal, we anyways go ahead with the testing at 24 to 28 weeks once again. There we use a diagnosis uh, for GDM, we use a 75 gram glucose, again a one-step approach which we are following is as recommended by ADA by using again 75 gram glucose and testing blood glucose at zero hour, one hour and two hours, and there we have cutoffs for that. Even if the lady has somewhere borderline blood glucose levels in the first trimester, these ladies might be at risk of developing GDM later, might be having little consequences, but we're not clear about that area. But anyways, we have to go ahead and test these ladies at 24 to 28 weeks, yeah. Sure. So I think that would be the end of this uh, pathway. Uh, so Dr. Parjit Kaur herself uh, should be presenting the second pathway to us. Yeah, no, the, so there are two step uh, procedures where you do 50 grams first and check one hour and then you go ahead with the 100 gram. That's a two step approach. So internationally, many places, two step approach is also followed. But what ADA and IADPSG rec uh, this recommends is just one step with 75 grams and test the step is not the values, it's just the procedure how you're doing it. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So um, our national guideline is the DIPSI guideline, which is you administer 75 gram fasting or non-fasting and do one value two hours later. And if it's 140 or more, it's GDM. So um, one of the things that, and, and we have a big GDM session coming up. So one of the things, and I completely, um, I'm a Harpo girl myself. I'm just saying that uh, one of the things that I uh, really um, wanted from this meeting also for all these clinical reasons for these clinical care pathways is for all of us to get on the same page. 
Otherwise, what happens is, whether it's a registry or whether it is data collection, research, uh, how we treat them, um, you know, we, we have very different approaches. So I, I think collectively and in a democratic way, uh, finally agree upon one thing that we can all do to get together. So uh, I think as of now, the national guideline is what we should follow. And that's being also followed by other South Asian countries. So um, we, I think, are the same kind of uh, people across. So, yeah. Yeah, so. And Dr. Usha is talking about the DIPSI guidelines. So I think I'll go with both of them here, Dr. Parjeet. In Delhi, we need not follow DIPSI because that's more for rural, semi-urban. So that somebody who's coming from a very far off place, whether fasting, non-fasting, give 75 grams glucose, test after two hours, more than 140, label as GDM. But in a place where you, uh, I mean, you and me are practicing, we can still go with IA, DPSG and we will do the uh, fasting. So I think this is same as what Dr. Tandon had earlier mentioned, individualized yeah. approach and a national level approach. So I, I have someone Dr. shouting at me that you are Indian. I am Indian, <laughs> but if our patients can, we can do So what Dr. Usha is referring to is more of a national policy thing. I think that's what we yeah. need to I, agree upon. I'm, I'm looking at more as, you know, otherwise we don't have, we have no real idea of what is the incidence or how are patients responding? So in you know, in some way we, we need to come together, the OBGYNs and us and pediatricians and everyone. And then let's see, we also have another GDM another session. session, on GDM that session. Yeah. So we move on to the next yeah. one. That recently I have come across many patients in pregnancy who are very, very resistant to get it done. They say we'll feel uh, nauseated and taking that 75 gram glucose is a big deterrent. Maybe they are procrastinating, they, maybe they don't want to be labeled as diabetic. So I have taken a different approach. I just tell them, do your PP at least three times a week. Lunch, breakfast and dinner. That was what would be, we would be treating in case it is exceeding 140. So at least we know that what they are and what they are eating and uh, we can catch them early and treat them accordingly. Although not in national guidelines, but this is a very practical approach I found. Yeah. Thank you. Now we move on to the next clinical care pathway, which is the preconception counseling. And uh, this is very, very important, as important as the pregnant, this uh, taking care of diabetes during pregnancy. As Dr. Tandon also told initially, how beautifully these ladies perform during pregnancy. They control the A1Cs. But I think equally important is to have a good preconception care uh, because the message goes with a very positive note that if a good care, preconception care is provided, a very good pregnancy outcome is possible as any other normal uh, lady without diabetes. So uh, ideally a pre-gestational uh, or preconception care should start minimum six months prior to the conception and we have not only the glycemic control here, multiple other things to look into. So the, my, my first question uh, goes to uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Beatrice. Uh, so how good should be a glycemic control? What goals should we give to the lady uh, about as far as the glycemic control is concerned and why this is so important to have a tight glycemic control preconception? So ideally, like all the guidelines suggest, an ideal preconception HbA1c should be less than 6.5 but may not be possible at all times. So at least a 7% should be fairly okay. And we are looking at the time of the organogenesis when we want a strict blood sugar control. So the message should be clear as to why we are looking at a HbA1c of less than 6.5 or 7. So the lady should be educated about the complications that arise if the HbA1c is you know, way above target, especially during the time of organogenesis. And that is why we are targeting a HbA1c of less than 6.5 or probably less than 7. And when the lady comes to us preconception, we also need to revisit her medications right. because that is also important. And we need to switch her over to insulin plus or minus metformin, which are considered safe. Yeah, very, very true. Uh, insulin remains the mainstay. Uh, what about uh, hypothyroidism? Because we know that hypothyroidism does coexist with diabetes. Uh, what should be the goals for that? How should we test? And, and uh, what about the ladies who are already taking treatment? And what about those who are not taking? So how should we go about that? So ideally, uh, those people who are already on treatment, we aim for a TSH of less than 2.5. 
Yeah. So that is the ideal TSH cutoff. And let's say somebody is not on treatment and now there is, this is again a gray area about who to treat and who not to treat. So during pregnancy, we do have different guidelines. And uh, the evidence as such is controversial even for you know, subclinical hypothyroidism before pregnancy, preconception. So what do we do? So that is what we were discussing and looking at the literature here. So more than four, you can treat the lady who's planning pregnancy. Right, right. I totally agree. Okay, so this was about the glycemic targets and managing hypothyroidism. So, uh, Dr. Belinda, what about, because lady will have, if she has coexistent hypertension, she's on a lot of BP medications, cholesterol medications, how should we go about these medications? Yeah. Uh, so, if the patient is already having hypertension, um, majority of the time, if it's type 1 or type 2, our preferred antihypertensive would be an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. Unfortunately, these should not be continued when the patient is planning a pregnancy. So it's important for us to review the medication list and knock off these medicines which are unsafe for pregnancy. So ACE inhibitor, ARB definitely has to come off. But what are the medications that we can use safely during pregnancy? I think the preferred medications are lepitolol, uh, methyl dopa, and nifedipine. You can also use clonidine and pras uh, prazosin. So these are all the safe medications. And if you are decided to treat somebody during pregnancy or planning pregnancy, Pregnancy, your target should be around 135 to 85 upper limit and uh, the systolic blood pressure not lower than 110. So these are the rough targets and if the patient is already on medication then ensure that you've given the switch to safe medications. Right, I totally agree. Uh, so we are not just happy about here achieving a good glycemic control targets and you know, because we have to look under also the complications. So Dr. Amla, uh, end organ assessment, what should be your approach uh, in the preconception counseling? Yeah, I think uh, she can go through a routine fundus examination to uh, check out if her retina is looking okay. And then, uh, of course, the renal uh, parameters. So uh, it's very ideal to calculate her EGFR based on her creatinine. Um, and going to the cardiac assessment, uh, if she has a very strong family history of cardiac disease, hypertension, and she herself is obese and has a history of PCOS and all that, it's always advisable to um, make her undergo a routine cardiac evaluation, at least with a baseline ECG and echo. So that would be the ideal steps to assess her end organ damage. Right, I totally agree. Especially in terms of retinopathy, we all know that it, is, it progresses during pregnancy. The lady has already a proliferative retinopathy. It's, it's advisable that should be treated before she conceives. And even if she has moderate to severe, we should be careful in achieving strict glycemic control suddenly because that might worsen the retinopathy. Yeah, it might so, aggravate the retinopathy. Exactly. So we need to be very careful in retinopathy and nephropathy. Um, now, coming on to the comorbidities, it's not just complications. Uh, these ladies also have existing other comorbidities. So, Dr. Beatrice, uh, what are the comorbidities we should be carefully looking into and how do we manage them? Yeah, rightly said, Dr. Parjit, because uh, as endocrinologists and clinicians, we just uh, we should not only be looking at the glycemic control or the thyroid. We should also look at what other comorbidities this lady could be having. So, let's say asthma or cardiac disorder. All this need to be optimized before the patient plans a pregnancy. And um, let's not forget that we will be facing both the spectrums of weight. So we do have underweight ladies, we do have overweight and obesity on the other hand. So these need to be optimized as well. And uh, let's not forget that anemia is still very common. So nutritional deficiencies, anemia has to be taken care of. And last but not the least, mental health, because this is a big thing in our lives, pregnancy. So the lady needs all the support that she can. And we cannot overemphasize on the need for adequate sleep as well. Right. It's very important. So uh, now the last, uh, the pillar in the pathway, the self-monitoring of blood glucose or CGM, because once she gets pregnant, she will be requiring a frequent monitoring. A CGM might also be required. So Dr. Belinda, how do we prepare the lady for this and how do we uh, uh, emphasize the significance and importance of this monitoring? 
I think uh, education and counseling are extremely important in the preconceptional period itself because once they become pregnant, your glycemic targets are going to be very tight and the patient has to monitor quite frequently and quite intensely. So I think it's a good practice to initiate them on glucose monitoring even before they uh, become pregnant. However, if you're talking about a type 2 uh, diabetes with well-controlled glycemia, I wouldn't really insist on multiple uh, glucose monitoring through the day. But if it's a type 1 diabetes, diabetes patient, then I think, if, and if they can afford it, continuous glucose monitoring is something definitely beneficial over multiple uh, pricks over the day, because it will give us a lot more information and the glycemic control is also going to be generally better. So if the patient can afford it, yes, we can encourage them to use continuous glucose monitoring. However, if it's a pre-gestational diabetes, type 2 diabetes, very well controlled, then I think you can uh, relax the um, intensity of the glycemic monitoring. Yes. So I think to summarize, uh, preconception counseling, a good pre-gestational diabetes management leads to a good pregnancy outcome. It needs, we need to spend some time with the lady first to explain the importance of it. Uh, changing the medication to insulin might take a lot of, uh, spending a lot of time in counseling and educating her, convincing her, but we must need to spend that time. And uh, uh, really making her aware of the targets is very, very important. Assessing the complications, comorbidities, until the time a good contraceptive advice should be given before uh, she uh, conceives. Thank you so much.